Ichabod Crane, based on the original story by Washington Irving. If we could journey back to that time in American history when Manhattan was but a Dutch market town, we would discover in the bosom of one of those spacious coves, which indent the eastern shore of the Hudson River, a small rural port generally known by the name of Towery Town. This name was given in former days by the good housewives of the countryside because of the natural inclination of their husbands to tarry about the village tavern on market days. About two miles from this village, there is a little valley among the high hills, which is one of the quietest places in the whole world. This sequestered glen has long been known as Sleepy Hollow, and its rustic lads are called the Sleepy Hollow Boys throughout the neighboring country. A drowsy, dreamy influence seems to hang over the land. Some say the place was bewitched in the early days. The whole neighborhood abounds with haunted spots, strange sights, and twilight superstitions. The dominant spirit that haunts this enchanted region is the apparition of a figure on horseback without a head, who sometimes been seen by the country folk galloping along the gloom of the night as if on wings of wind. This specter is known as the Headless Horseman of Sleepy Hollow. Into this quiet valley there came, late one drowsy afternoon, an itinerant schoolmaster from Connecticut by the name of Ichabod Crane. To see him strolling along with his coat flapping and fluttering about him, one might mistake him for some scarecrow escaped from a cornfield. He was tall and exceedingly lank. His head was small and flat on top with a long pointed nose that looked like a weather vane perched on his spindle neck. As Ichabod walked down the main street of the village reading a book, the townspeople were astonished at the sight of their new schoolmaster, but they soon found that he did his work well. He ruled over the children in one room schoolhouse by bearing in mind the golden maxim, spare the rod and spoil the child. Ichabod's Crane's scholars certainly were not spoiled. But after school he was the companion and playmate of the children, and would even walk some of the smaller ones home, especially if they happened to have pretty sisters or mothers noted for their good cooking. According to country custom in those parts, Ichabod boarded and lodged at the houses of the farmers whose children he instructed. He lived with each family a week and went the rounds of the neighborhood with all his worldly goods tied up in a large cotton handkerchief. Ichabod found other ways to increase his slender income. He was the singing master of the neighborhood and taught the young people to sing psalms. On Sundays, when he led the choir, his nasal voice resounded far above all the rest of the congregation. There was a particular quavering still heard in the church, and even half a mile off still Sunday morning, which are said to be descended from the nose of Ichabod Crane. The females of the neighborhood found the schoolmaster to be vastly superior in taste and accomplishments to the rough, sleepy hollow boys and their leader, Brom Bones, Ichabod was invited to tea at the farmhouses, or would take Sunday stroll with a whole bevy of country damsels along the banks of the mill pond, while more bashful country bumpkins hung sheepishly back, envying him. It was inevitable that Ichabod would become an object of ridicule to Brom Bones and his friends, but he didn't mind. He was content in the women's admiration of his great learning, for he had read several books quite thoroughly, and was a perfect master of Cotton Mather's History of New England Witchcraft, in which, by the way, he most firmly believed. There came a time, however, when the teacher's path was crossed by a being that causes more perplexity to mortal man than ghosts and goblins. That being was a woman, Katrina Van Tassel, the 18-year-old daughter and only child of old Baltus Van Tassel, the wealthiest farmer in the country. She was a blooming lass, plump as a partridge, ripe, melting, and rosy-cheeked, and a coquette. Now there was no doubt that the fair Katrina was the richest prize in the countryside, and the schoolmaster, being an ambitious man, at once began to fill his mind with hopeful suppositions. Ah, Katrina, my love, my treasure, he sang to himself, 
Who can resist your grace, your charm, and who can resist your father's farm? From the moment Ichabod decided to gain Katrina's affections, his peace of mind was at an end. He had more real difficulties than a knight errant of Yar who had only giants, dragons, enchanters, and such like to contend with. Ichabod had to win his way to the heart of a country flirt who was surrounded by a number of rustic admirers, including the most formidable obstacle of all, Brom Bones himself. Brom was famed for his great skill in horsemanship, being as dexterous on horseback as a tartar. He was foremost at all races and cockfights, and, with the leadership that bodily strength confers in rustic life, he was the umpire in all disputes. He was always ready either for a fight or a frolic, but had more mischief than ill will in his makeup. And with all his overbearing roughness, there was a strong dash of waggish good humor at the bottom. But such a rival with whom Ichabod Crane had to contend. Brahm had cleared the field of all other suitors, and the fair Katrina often wished some champion would appear and, for once, take the field openly against the boisterous Brahm, if only because competition would lend some spice to the courtship. And so she did not altogether discourage the schoolteacher's intentions. In this way, matters went on for some time. It was upon the occasion of her father's annual Halloween frolic that Katrina chose to stir up the embers of the smoldering rivalry. Thus, one invitation in particular carried a most personal and provocative summons. The gallant Ichabod was in a transport of joy. To him, this invitation could mean but one thing. He spent at least an extra half hour at his toilet, brushing and furbishing up his best, and indeed only, suit of rusty black, and admiring himself in a bit of broken looking glass that hung in the schoolhouse. Just be your own charming self, and the fair Katrina is yours for the asking, he told his reflection. So gaily bedecked, and nobly mounted on a broken down plow horse, he had borrowed for the occasion, Ichabod rode forth like a knight of old to keep a tryst with his fair lady. In all the countryside, there was nothing to equal a merrymaking at Mynheer Van Tassel's farm. Neighbors from miles around, dressed in their best, came to partake of the ample charms of a genuine Dutch country tea table in the sumptuous time of autumn. Such heaped-up platters of cakes of various kinds, known only to experienced Dutch housewives. There was the donut, the crisp and the crumbling cruller, Sweet cakes and short cakes, ginger cakes and honey cakes, a whole family of cakes, and there were apple pies, peach pies, and pumpkin pies, besides slices of ham and smoked beef, and moreover delectable dishes of preserved plums and peaches, pears, and quince, not to mention boiled shad and roasted chicken, and with the motherly teapot sending up its clouds of vapor into the mist, Ichabod Crane did ample justice to every dainty. The sound of music from the common room summoned all to the dance. Ichabod prided himself on his dancing as much as upon his singing voice. Not a limb was idle, and to have seen his loose frame clattering about the room, you would have thought St. Vitus himself, that blessed patron of the dance, was cutting figures before you in person. The lady of his heart was his partner, while Brom Bones, sorely smitten with love and jealousy, sat brooding by himself in a corner. There was no doubt that Ichabod was the man of the hour, but Brom Bones was a stubborn suitor and determined that, by fair means or foul, his time would come. When the night grew late, Van Tassel always called upon his guests to tell ghostly tales of Halloween. Brom knew that there was no more firm believer in spooks and goblins than Ichabod Crane, and he moved close to the teacher and began to tell a fearsome story of his midnight adventure with the headless horseman. Ichabod listened with eyes popping as Brom told of being pursued by the horseman, who was looking for a head to replace his own. Dramatically, Brom finished his tale. Now, if you doubt this tale is so, I met this spoke just a year ago, and I didn't stop for a second look but made for the bridge that spans the brook. For once you cross that bridge, my friends, the ghost is through, his power ends. Laughing at the terrified teacher, Brom continued, 
So when you're riding home tonight, look out, beware. Make for the bridge with all your might, because the headless horseman will be down near the hollow, looking for a head to take. The party now gradually broke up. The farmers gathered their families in their wagons, and some of the girls left on horseback with their favorite young men. Only Ichabod lingered behind, according to the custom of country lovers, to have a moment alone with the heiress, fully convinced he was now on high road to success. What was said between them no one knows, but something must have gone wrong, for Ichabod came out after a very short time looking quite unhappy and discouraged. Had the girl only been playing one of her coquettish tricks, encouraging the poor teacher in order to spend, speed the conquest of his rival? Looking neither to the right or left to gloat over Van Tassel's rich barns and fields, which he had so often dreamed of owning, Ichabod went straight to the stable. With several hearty cuffs and kicks, he roused his old horse, who had been soundly sleeping, dreaming of mountains of corn and oats, and the whole valleys of Timothy and Clover. It was the very witching hour of night that Ichabod pursued his travel homeward. The sky grew blacker as, one by one, the stars winked out, and driving clouds obscured the moon. Never had the schoolmaster felt so melancholy, so alone. And the nearer he approached the hollow, the more dismal he became. Once inside the murky glen, Ichabod felt more afraid, for now the forest seemed to close in behind him, and every detail of Brom's story returned to haunt him. He tried to whistle a song, but blowing leaves, an owl's hoo-hoo, the croaking of a frog, warning headless horsemen, headless horsemen, filled him with terror. And then he heard the sound of hooves in the distance, coming closer. Suddenly there was wild laughter, and a black horse carrying a headless rider reared up beside him. Ichabod's terror increased when he saw the head, which should have rested on the rider's shoulders, was carried before him instead. A sword whizzed past his ear. Ichabod's old horse ran as fast as he could with others pursuing him. Once again the terrible rider slashed at Ichabod's head with his sword. But if I can reach that bridge, thought Ichabod, I am safe. A convulsive kick in the ribs and the old nag sprang upon the bridge, thundered over the resounding planks, and gained the opposite side. And now Ichabod cast a look behind to see if his ghostly pursuer had vanished. Just then, to his horror, he saw the headless rider rise in the stirrups and hurl the grinning head at him. Ichabod tried to dodge the horrible missile, but too late it hit his head, tumbling him from his horse. The next morning they found the old horse cropping grass near his master's gate, but not a trace of the school teacher. On the far side of the bridge, however, there was discovered the hat of the unfortunate Ichabod, and close beside it, a shattered pumpkin. It was shortly thereafter that Brom Bones led the blooming Katrina to the altar. Now rumors persisted that Ichabod still lived, married to a wealthy woman in a distant country, but of course the old country wives where the best judges of such matters refused to believe such nonsense. They knew the schoolmaster had been spirited away by the headless horseman, and it is a favorite story often told in the neighborhood round the winter evening fire. Even today, a plowboy loitering homeward on a still autumn evening has sometimes thought he heard a voice in the distance chanting a melancholy song in the tranquil solitude of Sleepy Hollow. <laughs>